Okay. Um, so tonight we're um, we're in week ten um, of the power, and the, and the title is the power of light. And we're going to be looking at four um, four events in the life of Elisha. Um, next week will be windy with the penetrating light, and then of course the next week is Thanksgiving, so we will not be having class. And then on December 2nd, Holly will be um, bringing us see the light. And then we'll end up on December 9th um, with Gretchen um, doing reflected light. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you with hearts that are uh, full of many emotions. And we pray for um your healing and presence and um we pray for our open hearts for this study tonight and in the coming weeks and um, days for each one of us father we thank you that we have this avenue of prayer and that you hear us and that as we've been reminded by cassandra so many times that you love each one of us individually and that you care about each of our needs and and take such good care of us and help us to turn to you first um, when we're in trouble and to turn to you first when we're um, in places of joy. Father, we do have some people to bring before you tonight. We pray for all of those dealing with COVID. We thank you that the Spencer family seems to be getting past it now and uh, we pray for Robin and I don't know if Diane has it but pray for that family and we pray for um, Lois McFarland and we pray for Gabby and JD Helsel and pray that uh, the rest of them don't get it and are safe. Um, we pray for Dick's recovery. We thank you so much that that surgery went well. We pray that um, he will do much better with this replacement surgery than he had with the other and continue to be with Shelva as she heals and as they deal with their health issues. Father, we pray for the Connor family. You know their needs, and, and we just pray that um, they'll be at peace and patient with the process. Father, we pray for the Reem family, um, at the loss of Phyllis, and for, the, um, and for all of Phyllis's friends, and um, it sounds, you know, what a wonderful woman she was, and we just um, thank you for those lives that she's that she blessed thank you for her life and all the people that she has blessed father we do pray for victoria door we pray that um, they can find a solution to the paralysis and um, that she'll be able to breathe on her own and that she will be able to survive this and to heal and to be back to functioning well um, we pray for Jim Wallingford and his ongoing um, cancer treatments, and we thank you that his surgery on Monday went well. Continue to be with him in that healing and help him to keep turning to you and to um, be at peace with this whole situation. Father, we thank you that Karis and Elijah are healing, and we pray that they'll continue to heal well and continue to do well. We thank you that Karis is in the smaller cast and um, is able to bend her knee now. And, um, and we just pray for people who are helping to take care of them because um, we know that that's a complicated thing sometimes. Father, we pray for all of those who are traveling or will be traveling um, this weekend for people I know and, and for people traveling through the holidays and um, just bless their travels, bless their times with their families and their times of relaxation. Uh, Father, we pray for the visit this week with Griffin Webster, the candidate for internship. We pray that your will would be done and that it will be clear. Um, and we pray that you will know um, or that he will do a good job and that it will be a good fit. <coughs> Father, we pray for continuing prayers for the college program and um and also for the ball family and uh, we just thank you for the people who have stepped up to help um that program and just be with the college students and help them to 
um, continue to have faith in you and to for the program to be able to grow and uh, be with Rick Reynolds, especially as he is the deacon in charge of that program. And, um, and as I say, with the, the people who have stepped up to help. And Father, I just want to say thank you for the Golden Agers program and what um, those that group of women or, or people mean to us and and uh, and that they can get together once a, a month in the and um, what a great time that we have. Uh, bless Jennifer as she teaches tonight and help her to have clear thoughts and um, to say what you would have her say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Definitely need clear thoughts. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Let's make sure. Yep. That's up. All right. Why should I be so Why should I show? Why should I? Okay, so Cassandra kind of stated at the very beginning of this lesson that it really could be called the faithful care of our loving God. And that is exactly what this, um, these four um, stories, these four events um, tell us. Um, you know, throughout the Bible, we can see um, the providence of God. We can see his care for us. We can see how faithful he is to all of us. Um, 
And so I thought that was the perfect song. Um, even in the very little things like a sparrow, um, you know, um, out in the wild, um, God is, God cares. And so um, I wanted us to read um, Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 to 31. Um, are not two sparrows sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. And so tonight, what we're really looking at is, um, oops, didn't mean to go there yet, um, is how God takes care of us. And opening our eyes to see um, things that we might have called coincidences that probably aren't. Um, ways that he takes care of even just very minute details in our lives. Um, and then how we can use those to share with others how God works and how God can change their lives. And so that's the power. That's the power of light. Um, when we experience that light, when we recognize it, when we see it, and I love how Wendy said um, and, she, and gave us that example of how she has been praying for God to open her eyes and see more of those times where he is working in her life. Um, and that's, that's the whole goal. That's what we want to see. We want to see how he is working in our story. And then we can share that with others. Um, who are so desperate to have um, a loving, faithful God working in their life. Um, and that's the power that grows the church. Um, that's the power of being light in this world. And so we're going to look at um, four, you know, pretty everyday events of life and how God orchestrated and worked through those events. So I, I started each of the events with the um, verses that talk about it in 2 Kings. And if you guys read the book, Cassandra tells us that 2 Kings is really not chronological. So these events um, that kind of jump, it's kinda, she kind of jumps around. Um, and so the events are not chronological <laughs> either. And it may look like we're jumping here and there, but... Um, but that's how Second Kings is laid out. So um, our first story, um, we have, um, we get to see um, more of the Shunammite woman's story um, with Elisha. And so this is found in Second Kings 8, but probably happened before the events in Second Kings 5. So just, you know, that's kind of how things go in Second Kings. Um, so the Shunammites land restored. Um, would anybody like to um, read this section? I can do it. Thank you. Now Elisha had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life, Arise and depart with your household, and sojourn wherever you can. For the Lord has called for a famine, and it will come upon the land for seven years. So the woman arose and did according to the word of the man of God. She went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And at the end of seven years, when the woman returned from the land of the Philistines, she went to appeal to the king for her house and her land. Now the king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me all the great things that Elisha has done. And while he was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life, behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life appealed to the king for her house and her land. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, here is the woman, and here is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed an official for her, saying, Restore all that was hers, together with all the produce of the fields from the day that she left the land until now. Thank you. 
So coincidence? <laughs> I think not. I mean, literally Gehazi is right there in the presence of the king, relating her story to the king when she walks in. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't orchestrate that better in a movie, right? Um, God is working. Um, and in turn, um, she ends up getting everything back um, along with the produce um, that, that the fields had produced from the day she left until now. Um, so talk about a huge blessing in her life. And she trusted and obeyed. She trusted what Elisha told her. She knew Elisha to be a faithful man of God. She knew that what she was doing was God's orders or will for her. And so she trusted and obeyed and then came back to find, you know, this kind of disaster because she no longer had her property or her house. And God restores all of it and more. Um, and we see too um, in Deuteronomy, um, Cassandra points out that that famine is one of the judgments that God brought on his people when they turned from him. And, you know, this was a dark time in Israel. This was a time of Baal worship. This was a time um, where they were turning their back on God. And so that famine was probably judgment. And he not only spared her having to endure the famine, but then restored all that she had lost. And so I wanted then, after we kind of read the story and talked about it a little bit, um, I wanted to look at a New Testament example. And that worked for everybody but the last one. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, but here is um, the story of the blind man um, restored to sight. And so John 9, 8 through 12, um, the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. I mean, they could not have really thought that, but maybe they did. But he kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, here he is telling how God has worked in his life, telling how Jesus worked in his life. The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, trusted and obeyed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. But because he told what had happened to him, how God had worked in his life, what do they want to know? Where is he? Where can we find this Jesus? Um, so, you know, what a great and wonderful um, example both of those stories are of, of people trusting and obeying what they've been told by God and then having um, precious things restored to them. Um, Cassandra said, learning the story of God's work in your heart is one of life's greatest joys. Sharing it with others is one of life's greatest privileges. So you don't have to do this specifically, but think of, but if you would like to share, I would love to hear them. Describe a way in which God has worked in your life. How might telling your story help someone else see God's love at work in their own life? I can share one. So, um, yeah, so um, you guys may not know this, but I used to work at an international school in Papua New Guinea. And then I came back from working at the international school um, in 2014. So I came back to the States um, and one of the reasons that I came back was I came back to work in a ministry that um, reached out to um, an immigrant population here in Columbus um, 
and I'm being a little vague because this is recorded, but an immigrant population here in Columbus that is Muslim. And uh, we there was a school in the Columbus area um, for um, this people group um, and kind of like an ESL school. Um, so I went back to help with that. And it was like an outreach, like a Christian outreach. And um, I was in that program for like, I think I was with them for two years. So I taught in the program for a year. And then the couple that I was working with and I went to a country in um, the Horn of Africa um, to learn the language of this people group. Um, and while I was there, the couple I was working with decided they wanted to close the school here in Columbus and they wanted to start working in Africa. And at that point in my life, I was single and I didn't really want to go to Africa. Um, I had come back to the States partially because I have a brother who has autism. I wanted to be closer to my family. And I just was like kind of in crisis mode or whatever. And, um, and I came back, you know, tried to get back into teaching. I taught at a charter school for a while. That was really awful. Um, subbed for a while, then I taught in um, a school for, uh, a Catholic school for a couple of years through Columbus City. Um, but I wanted a job where I was paid salary because my other job, I was paid hourly and it just was not good for us financially. Um, and so God provided the job at, at Jonathan Alder where I'm teaching now. But the interesting thing about my job now is that we keep on getting Muslim students um, at the elementary. Now, right now, it's not like a lot of them. Um, I have four Palestinians and an Iraqi um, right now. And then at the high school, I have two Egyptian kids. Um, but even though these people are, they're like a different people group than what I was working with before. Um, I did a lot of reading and stuff about that religion, you know, Islam, mm -hmm. um, when I was with this ministry for those two years. And, um, you know, even though I'm teaching in a public school, I feel like, um, I don't know, like, I wasn't sure how God was going to use that time that I was working with that ministry because it was pretty hard on me when things didn't work out. You know, I had mm -hmm. been working in Papua New Guinea like nine years and I was like, I left that to come to the States to work with this other ministry. And then it just didn't seem to work out. And, you know, I invested time and people had donated money and all this stuff. And it was just like, it seemed kind of wasted, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. It's it'll be interesting. I mean, I just started working at Jonathan Alder, but it seems like we're getting a lot of people that used to live in Dublin because they're they're building these new housing developments. Um, there's like five housing developments in the Jonathan Alder School District that are being built, and a lot of people are moving. Like I just got a new little Iraqi girl. Um, so yeah, just people that maybe were in Dublin or uh, Hilliard before, and they're getting a new house in Jonathan Alder School District and are moving over there. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. But um, I don't know, sometimes after a while, like you, you can kind of see how something can be used. Um, when several years ago, I was like, not sure. Right all that time and effort and everything it just seemed like it was kind of wasted but um i mean i knew god didn't waste things but it's just interesting so yeah and that's one of cassandra's quotes in here that we're gonna read <laughs> um so yes i mean absolutely i think that you are in a place in a time you know to do a lot of good um and and to help people see God's love through you. Absolutely. Um, that's amazing. I think that's really cool because like you said, you know, it's been a while and, and you didn't see any fruit of that. And now you are. And that's, that's really awesome. Anybody Can else I, have any comments? Oh, I, I have a comment. I was, um, 
it, there was a speaker and I'm sorry, I don't remember who, but he came to um, the church at Fishinger Road and on Fishinger <laughs> Road. <laughs> I have to think about that every time. <laughs> anyway, he came and he was speaking to us. It was an education development meeting and I don't remember who all was there. Um, but I want to remember was his saying that we should tell our children our conversion stories or how we, you know, and I didn't grow up in the church, but I thought I was a Christian and I could go into it, but I won't right now because it's kind of long. But um, it was interesting because he was saying, have you ever told your children that? He asked me specifically to share my story, which I did. And then he said, have you ever told your children that? And I'm like, no. <laughs> he said, well, you should. But it's that same point Cassandra's making. You know, my children grew up in the church. So it was good for them to see, to hear my story. Yes, absolutely. And help them then see God's love at work in their own life. <laughs> absolutely. And just real quick to tag on to that, I did not know my mom's um, story, conversion story, until I was, I don't know, 30, probably. And, um, you know, you would think I would have known younger, but it really meant a lot. It, there's just, it, it was awesome to hear it and to understand a lot of things and mm -hmm. just see God work. Yes, we need it. And Cassandra even suggests in, in this um, lesson this week that we, we share some of our struggles and how God helped us through them. Um, that is very good for our children to hear too, and for our friends and for our um, family. And, you know, again, that when, when you open up about that and, and give God the credit for it and, you know, let them see how that happened, um, then they're going to that's going to open their eyes to more of, of what he has done in their life. So anyway, anybody else have anything they want to share? Okay. So I just wanted to read, this is on page 146. Um, like the Shunammite woman, every Christian has a story to tell about the way God has touched our lives. Each day we have the privilege of opening our eyes and being aware of the myriad of ways that God is moving and working in our lives. They are, pow they are the powerful stories of lives changed and hearts mended. They are the quiet stories of care given and needs met. They are the sorrowful stories of sin, brokenness, and emptiness and joyful stories of love, forgiveness, and grace. Some may wonder if they have a story to tell. I assure you that if you walk with Christ, you do. Ask him to open your eyes. Listen for the ways that he answers prayer. Talk to your children about the way he helped you through a struggle. Keep a record of your blessings. Over time, you will learn to read the pages he is adding to the story of your walk with him. And then to wrap this up, Second Chronicles 16, which we had to write, verse 9a. Um, and again, this is how, why the song, his eyes on the sparrow came into my head. It kept coming to my head for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Um, his eyes range throughout the earth. So that was story one. <laughs> that was event one, um, a court case where God works through it. And here we are on day two. Um, and the second event is um, about caring for um, the one of the, the um, schools of prophets that Elisha would visit. Um, this one was the one in Gilgal and um, how he, he purifies a deadly stew. So who would like to um, read this? I would appreciate it. 
I can. Thank you. And Elisha came again to Gilgal when there was a famine in the land. And as the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his servant, set on the large part, set on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. One of them went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it his lap full of wild gourds and came and cut them up into the pot of stew, not knowing what they were. And they poured out some for the men to eat. But while they were eating of the stew, they cried out, O oh man of God, there is death in this pot. And they could not eat it. He said, Then bring flour. And he threw it into the pot and said, Pour some out for the men that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. Okay, so. This was, she talked about this. And I should have marked it and I didn't. Oh, okay. The, yeah, here it is. Okay. On page 149, she talked about he gathered a large quantity of the vine's fruit and adds it to the cooking pot. It seems probable that, that the gourd collected by the young man is the wild squirting cucumber, which sounds horrible just in its name. A vine with particularly bitter tasting fruit. The yellow melon shaped gourds are known to cause severe diarrhea, which can lead to death. So they were not, that was not just an exaggeration that there's death in the pot. There really was death in the pot. Um, they, you know, this was um, them um, really, you know, a very real concern um, for them. So that's the, that's the event, that's the story. Um, but leading up to that is the fact that this school of prophets um, were gathering together to sit at the feet of Elisha and learn. And that's kind of what Cassandra talks about first. So we're going to go um, on to our New Testament example here and, um, and then come back around to the deadly stew. Um, so he goes to Martha and Mary, of course, or she goes, sorry. She goes to Martha and Mary, of course, for um, sort of a, a New Testament way to, um, to look at this situation. Um, so Luke 10, 38 through 42. Um, now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve you alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And so we have another example of somebody sitting, um, at the Lord's feet or sitting at, you know, a teacher's feet. And this is the good portion. This is the better portion. This is what helps us to see um, God working in our lives and, and then being that powerful light to others. Um, and, and she points out, um, you know, Mary wasn't doing nothing. <laughs> it wasn't like she was just, you know, hanging out, watching TV. Um, she said, look at verse 39. Um, Mary sat and listened to his teaching. And that, you know, that word listen is not just that she was hearing sound, but that she was taking it into her heart. Um, and just as those um, sons of the prophets, that school of prophets um, was doing with Elisha. So take a minute and quiet your heart before the Lord. Ask him to help you choose the better way every day. Um, again, that is going to help us to be that powerful light and to show others the way. Okay, now let's think about the stew. 
so we have this poison stew <laughs> and um death in the pot just as you know the nation was in spiritual death um we were in spiritual death you know romans 6 23 the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life um and and i find it very interesting that um the thing that the thing that um purified the pot was the actual sacrifice that the poorest in israel were asked to give and that is flour and you can find that in leviticus 5 11 through 13 and so knowing that they were in a famine knowing that they were um you know learning um to be prophets of god learning from elisha the um the way of of god and learning you know more about him um they probably didn't have you know a huge sacrifice to give um and so god chose the thing that um that, that that they would have easily accessible to um purify their stew um and so he took care of even you know that their their food and during that famine um someone had made a mistake and you know caused a big problem and god took care of it because he cares for us um and and every little thing in our life oh sorry so in what ways um do you think this do is a picture of the spiritual health of the nation of israel anybody think of anything else that besides what i just said I just thought of the fact that there's a lot of Baal worship going on and you could say that the Baal worship was poisoning the nation. Mm -hmm. Just as the poisons do. So, yeah, I think that he was, um, I think that God was giving them, you know, a very real example <laughs> in their life of also um, of what is going on around them. Um, and she ends up with choose today to sit before the Lord, listen to his words, they are life. The bread he offers you will satisfy the deepest hunger of your soul. Okay, story number three. Can I have somebody read this one? I can read it. Thank you. Sure. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, give to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, give them to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them <coughs> and they ate and had some left according to the word of the Lord. And of course, this um, very much reminds us of the feeding of the 5,000 or the 4,000, either when you want to look at. Um, here this man is you know, trying to bring um, the first fruits of his harvest um, as an offering to God, um, a sacrifice and an offering to God. And Cassandra pointed out that probably, you know, normally that would be taken to the priest, but because of the fact that there were no priests of God, you know, in this time, um, he brought it to the man of God that he knew. You know, Elisha obviously had a reputation. Um, people knew about Elisha. They knew he was a man of God. And um, 
I kind of feel like, um, you know, Elijah, and she pointed this out, Elijah was, you know, sort of on the national stage, the big events, the, you know, dealing with the king and queen and um, all that, whereas Elisha is more a one-on-one -on -one kind of person. Um, he was more, you know, involved in the daily lives of the people. And, and so, you know, so the people would have talked about him and, and spread that light um, around. And so this man brings this offering, this first fruits um, to Elisha. And so Elisha said, you know, says to Gehazi, I give it to, you know, give it to the men. And he's like, whoa, wait a minute. How can I give this to a hundred men? <laughs> And it sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Just like the disciples said, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, five loaves and two fish. That's not going to cut it. <laughs> that's not going to do it. Um, so let's look at that story. Um, I took it out of John 6, 9 through 13. Um, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. Um, but what are they for so many? Um, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled the 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Um, and so again, you know, here we are, what, what's that for so many, you know, how can we set that before 5,000? Um, but, but God is working in both of those situations. God is blessing that offering, the offering of the gentleman of his first fruits, the offering of the five loaves and two fish from the boy. Um, he was, you know, they were both willing to give that to God and then God blessed it abundantly. Um, and so Cassandra's, you know, point is, are we hungering and thirsting for the things of God? You know, this was, um, God feeding people who were physically hungry and thirsty, but are we hungering and thirsting for righteousness as is one of the Beatitudes in Matthew five. God calls us to give him more than sorry more than a check once a week he wants your heart he longs for your life he desires your full dedication he wants us a hunger and thirst for him in what ways do you think god calls us to offer him first fruits today most of us are not farmers right <laughs> So we can't offer bread and fish. Would anybody? I guess, like when, I guess. I guess when I read this, I thought about supporting the church and how people will give. Like they got to pay this bill, they got to pay that bill, and then they'll give to the church after they get done. That's not the first fruits. Mm hmm. That's kind of what I thought of. Okay. I like that. Very good. I like how she uh, related to um, the best. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't, not just the leftover, not the leftovers, but the best and the first. Very best. Mm hmm. That was kind of the direction I took and, and and this may be what Gretchen was going at but I was thinking about well that of course reflects what Sandy was saying but I was thinking about it as far as time goes too so what that means to me then is that I've got to plan time in my schedule that is dedicated to time with God um, in study and prayer um, not just go okay I've got a moment now I might as well do this now you know but to really plan it mm -hmm. Right. And, and along those, those same lines with time, you know, if you fall asleep, no matter what you're doing at eight o'clock at night, then that's not when you should study 
or pray or spend time with God. You know, you need to to use your best time too. You know what I mean? Like the mm-hmm. time where you're going, you're going to get the most out of it, but it, but also just that it, you can be the most focused and the best <laughs> give your best you know i think though a big part of the first fruits though it's not just about the best and i think certainly in our you know society right now it, it's almost hard for us because we've got so much good um mm-hmm. that we we can give a lot before it hurts and before we honestly barely notice it whether it's our time whether it's um you know certainly of our material possessions and money and things like that and but really the first fruits and certainly um in biblical times you know it being the first sheep and the first what it was really showing was that you had faith there would be more and so mm-hmm. that your needs were still going to be taken care of and so by giving the first thing because you know certainly back then and certainly in other parts of our world not even now you know you giving up your food you're not completely sure that you're going to have more (laughs) it's not a guarantee you know it's not like us now where well we'll, we know it's there and um and so the first fruits was a lot about faith and so even these stories being in the context of a famine going on you know we see it that you know god's power um you know, he, he works it in a lot of ways, whether it's through timing, like we saw with the Shunammite woman there in the first story, whether it's, um, you know, through, you know, just having, using what we would consider small things, um, you know, that just, just the smallest sacrifice and he can do amazing things or just, you know, he take, he takes the smallest one, the, the, that he, you know, is needed or expected and everything and creates these amazing things. And so, so this man bringing, you know, the bread and certainly the little boy there, you know, when we see the feeding of the 5,000 with Jesus, you know, he, he gave everything he had (laughs) and he he didn't know for sure that he was going to, where his food would come from then he was giving it all to, you know, Jesus to do something with. And, um, and so, so the first fruits, you know, when we look at ourselves, I think we need to look at well, what would we need to give up that's going to show our faith, that's going to show, I have no guarantee, um, certainly from a secular standpoint, I just trust though that God will take care of it. And so, um, and and I think of, and I I hope it's okay that I use this because she used it in a a class one time that she was teaching, but Diane Houston talked about um, that um, she and Paul, I guess they were a part of a congregation that um, money had been um, embezzled or something like that. Anyway, the church, it's the congregation itself was in some financial troubles. And um, and so she said that Paul came home and was like, um, we're going to take out a loan to help the congregation. That they didn't actually have the money themselves. They were going to go figure out how to take out a loan to give to the congregation wow. so that they could give to the congregation. And I just remember, cause I was very young at that point and, and Diane, bless her heart. She goes, when Paul first said it, I was like, what? <laughs> she, <laughs> she goes, admittedly, I didn't love the idea, but, um, <laughs> but I just thought that, wow, that was sacrifice yeah. that, you know, that, you know, Paul was like, no, God will provide and he will make sure that, you know, we have what we need and everything the the church needs this and so they did it and uh, and diane was like and of, of course it all worked out fine and everything but but like that is giving of, of your first fruits in the sense that um you know it's giving to the point that it, that you have to show that you have faith that god is going to provide and, and give what you what you really need and and i think it's just a tough one that it's hard for us to even honestly fathom and understand in our society today it is much more difficult for us i will agree um and i and i love how you pointed that back to faith um because that is the most important component of our giving and um she points out um second corinthians 8 um where the macedonian people are um talked about here and it's uh, it says and now brothers and sisters we want you to know about the grace that god has given the macedonian churches so god has poured out his grace on these churches in the midst of a very severe trial we don't know what their overflowing joy and extreme and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity for i testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely 
on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord. So that was the first thing. That faith, that giving of yourself to God was the first thing they did. Then they were able to just, you know, give with faith, with faith that God would prov provide. Um, and, and then by the will of God also to us. Um, so they, you know, giving themselves to the Lord was the most important step there. And then they were able to give exceedingly more because, of, again, because they had faith that God would provide. So I'm also going to read um, a little bit from the bottom of page 153. Um, God calls us to give him more than a check once a week. He wants your heart. He longs for your life. He desires your full dedication, which we already did. In giving every piece of ourselves to him, we open the door for him to move and work powerfully through us. When we stop hoarding our time, our talents, our money, our energy, and our gifts, and spread them out before him, we will be amazed how he can use what seems like so little to us. No gift offered to the Lord will sit idle. And that's, you know, exactly what Sandy was saying earlier. Um, God blesses abundantly, um, you know, with our trusting, our obeying, our faith in him, um, you know, when we offer what we have he will just open the storehouses of heaven as another verse says that might be i wanted to read malachi 3 10 too is that where that says i think that might be where that says that bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room to store it. They didn't understand that they were robbing him by not giving their best in faith. And he says, test me on this. I will open the floodgates of heaven. Wow, that's powerful. All right, last story. I knew it was gonna be hard to get this last one in. Um, this story was one of Jared's favorites when he was a little kid. He just loved this idea of, of this happening. Um, so, 2 Kings 6, 1 through 7, the axe head recovered. Um, I have any volunteers to read this? Okay, I will do it. Just got a okay. drink of water. All right. Um, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, see the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Um, so they're running out of room. Let us go to the Jordan and each of us get there a log and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he answered, go. Then one of them said, be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, his ax head fell into the water. And he cried out, alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. Um, Cassandra points out several things with this. Um, number one, an iron axe 
was new technology back then. <laughs> um, you know, the Iron Age and everything and making tools of iron. Um, so it was probably pretty expensive. Um, and it was borrowed. And so the person that had borrowed this now was going to owe money for that axe. And he probably couldn't pay it, which would possibly force him into slavery. Um, so this one incident could literally change his life badly. Um, very bad things could happen. And Elisha immediately jumps in and he cuts off the stick and throws it in there. And um, it was not magnetic, <laughs> but God caused that iron axe head to float up. And, and he took care of just, just this little accident, this little situation for us. It may look like a little situation, but for the gentleman, it was, that was a huge thing um, that, that, and, and it was restored. Um, and, and he called out immediately to Elisha. Um, what am I going to do? You know, it was borrowed and Elisha then immediately takes care of it. Um, I really, I couldn't, I mean, I, th I thought of just all kinds of stories where things are lost um, in the New Testament um, and then, and restored. We have several parables about things that are lost and God restores. Um, we were lost <laughs> and God restored us. And so, um, you know, there were all kinds of, of ones that we could think about, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, like a real situation, um, you know, at least that I, I couldn't think, come up with like a real situation where someone had lost something and then it was recovered or restored like this. Um, but anyway, so we don't have a New Testament example of this. Um, so anyway, um, God is interested in every aspect of our lives. There is nothing that is too trivial or unimportant to bring before the Lord. And we need to always, always, always remember that. Um, that, that we can pray about anything. We can go to him about anything. Um, that he is working in every aspect of our lives. Um, you know, his eye is on the sparrow and he cares for us um, so much. And I just wanted to end as, as Cassandra ended. First Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him for he cares for you. Anybody have any comments they would like to make? I had wondered what the law had to say about borrowing things. And so um, I looked it up and it's ex Exodus 22, verse 14. And it says, if a man borrows anything of his neighbor and it is injured or dies, the owner not being with it, he shall make full restitution. Mm -hmm. Of course, it sounds like it's talking about a living thing, but um, I think the principle's still there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. Yes. Got to be careful with those borrowed goods. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I thought those were four really interesting stories. Um, I had never, I never even knew the one about the ax head until Jared's kindergarten teacher told it. And then he was kind of obsessed with it. Like he loved that story. Um, and I don't remember, I know I've read it before because it kind of sounded familiar, but I don't specifically remember the one about the poison stew either. Um, so yeah, really fun um, and great events to show God's care for us. And with the one with the stew, I found it interesting. I had just forgotten about um, that flour was 
the um, offering for um, those with the least means. And, and I just had totally forgotten that. And so then I was like, well, that totally, because at first I'm like, well, the flower, you know, they must just had it. And it was just what God told him to do. And no, of course, there was a reason behind it. Mm -hmm. And so I found that interesting um, that either I didn't catch it the first time or I forgot. And specifically, it was a sin offering. And so I really think right. God was making a very visual um, illustration there to them that, you know, this is what right. the nation is going through there. And this, and, and I'm going to give you a sin offering, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, we, there will be a sin offering, you know? Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you, Jennifer. You did a wonderful oh, job as usual. You are so welcome. And well, it was, it was so easy to kind of outline this and put it together because there were literally four different stories with a, you know, with a pretty good theme going throughout. So. And not two chapters to cover. Exactly. It was just a few verses here and there. That's right. <laughs>